nestuan na kau kikas kiniwa. In nagsik skenawa, niksa nuhtu to, niksa nuhtu. Tapi, my uh, Blackfoot name is Lohorn. My English name that I'm known by is Leroy Little Bear. I'm from the small ropes band of the Kainai tribe and we're part of the uh, Blackfoot Confederacy. My background is as a uh, Blackfoot uh, Indian is I was born and raised on the uh, reserve outside of the city of Lethbridge. When I was brought up by my parents who are both Blackfoot, both from the same reserve. And it was a fight for, if I can put it that way, for everyday existence. Seven of us were boys and then only one girl. So she had the rough time. She had to deal with the boys. Egalitarian notions were very much part of the everyday life. I grew up alongside my uncle and he, you know, he was the one that taught me a lot of things that I do know and so on, both both skill-wise and both, uh, you know, intellectually and so on about Blackfoot culture and this and that, native ways of thinking. My uncle Bernard, he was probably the most influential in my mom. Uh, not to say that my dad was not uh, influential, but probably in a much, at a much later time in my life. Daily life was fun. I don't, we never knew we were poverty that we were in poverty. I never even knew that. We were, we had fun and it was, in fact, in many cases, it was freedom. And I went to school all my life at the, uh, on a, one of those residential, I think better known as boarding schools in the United States. I went to a community college called Wenatchee Valley College in Wenatchee, Washington where I took up forestry. But in high school, my uh, interest had always been in science, especially physics. Those were my favorite subjects and so on. So eventually, the University of Lethbridge came into existence in the late 60s. And my mom called me up. He knew that I had always wanted to go to university and said, hey, they just established a university over here in Lethbridge. You should come home and uh, go to school here. So I did. They opened doors for students in September of 1967. And I came in the uh, spring semester of 1968. And I've been here as, an in, as a professor of Native American studies since 1975, I think it is. For a couple years, I was absent from the university, and that as I was over at Harvard University, I went over there to run their Native American program. But due to deaths in my family and in my wife's family, we decided to come back home. And when we came back home, the university says, oh, we're glad you're back. I've been back since then. When I first came to the University of Lethbridge, I started out in science, and I was in fact going to go into chemistry. I ended up changing my mind, and I ended up going into the legal field. There were other people that had an interest in science, that had an interest in native uh, philosophy, worldviews, and things like that that were over here at the university. One of those people was, of course, my wife, Amethyst, and she had a friend that was working here on a different project, but had those type of interest. And as a result of our interest in getting together over coffee and visiting each other, we ran into another physicist over here at the University of Lethbridge, uh, who's uh, of Japanese origin. He, uh, his name is Sam Canuso. 
And between all of us, we'd get together and talk about science, and we started comparing worldviews and paradigms and so on, saying, where, you know, where do scientists come from? Where do Aboriginal people come from when they're talking philosophy? What paradigms are they actually using? As a result of those types of gatherings and so on that we held locally over here, um, we decided to uh, have a science conference. And we ended up organizing the science conference and we invited different people from all over. In our discussions, in our many discussions, I should say with Sam Canoso, he did mention David Bohm, and he says, read this guy, read his writings. A lot of the things you guys are talking about are the kind of things David Bohm is talking about. So I did, and that's where my interest and so on in David Bohm originated from. When we were organizing this conference, this first science conference, which was back in 1988 or 1989, Sam Canoso said, there is, there is a scientist who lives in Ottawa by the name of David Peet, who has worked closely with David Bohm. Why don't we try to get him? He did come, and that science conference was very successful, and he in turn introduced us to David Bohm. And the way this happened was, David Bohm, I'm not sure if you've heard the story, was on the uh, McCarthy list. Have you ever heard of the story? Well, read David Peet's book about uh, the life and times of David Bohm. In the late 40s, early 50s, David Bohm, during the McCarthy witch hunts, was being asked to testify against one, one of his friends. And he refused to. And as a result, he was put on the bad list. And, uh, you know, and when he was put on the bad list, he ended up leaving the uh, United States and eventually ended up in England. And so for the longest time, David Bohm was not allowed, he was blacklisted, he was not allowed into the United States. And it was only after many years that he was given permission to come to the United States for a visit here and there to give him, to give talks and so on. So on those occasions that he would be coming to the United States, he would stop at certain places, including the farm, a place over just north of New York City. It used to be a farm, but they converted it into kind of like a, a meeting place, a small conference center, and so on. And so David Pete invited us, and he's, he says, hey, David Boom is going to be coming to the farm, okay? Would you like to come and meet with him? And of course, you know, I said, geez, I'd love, because after reading his stuff, I'd love to meet the man. So my first, my first uh, meetings with David Bohm was at the farm there north of New York City. And we had, I met with him for a couple days, you know, we took talk all day, all night type of thing, you know. And after that meeting, David Pete and myself, plus a couple other people, uh, the most important one being a lady by the name of Carol Hedges. Carol Hedges was working for the Fetzer Institute in Kalamazoo, Michigan. It's also one of those places that David Bohm would make a stop over at. The Fetzer Institute agreed to put on a dialogue uh, in the spring of 1992. We brought in all these native elders, scientists, physicists, linguists, and so on. So as a result, we decided to ask to hold another dialogue someplace. Fetzer Institute graciously agreed, and we ended up holding that dialogue 
in the fall of 1992 at the Banff Center, west of Calgary. Of course, it was in the fall of 1992 that David Bohm passed away. And so, with his passing, we had maybe three, four more dialogues, but always kind of in David Bohm's memory. And it was as a result of those dialogues at the Banff that people like Moonhawk, you know, Dan Alford, came up from California. After a year or two, he did bring his students, one of them being Nancy Mary Boy and David Begay, who were going to school at the California Institute of Integral Studies, the same school that Glenn Perry graduated from. So that's how that tie was made. Having had three, four uh, dialogues over here at Banff, the idea came up mainly from Moonhawk to have a dialogue in the South because the event, the idea was, geez, wouldn't it be nice if we can have a dialogue in the South and maybe in the West and maybe over there in the East, you know, kind of in the four directions. But it never really did pan out. So we've had Northern Dialogues, and so in the mid-90s or thereabouts, uh, the Southern Dialogue in, with the uh, cooperation between uh, Moonhawk and Glenn Perry, uh, we started, they started it up those and I was invited to go and facilitate. When the first dialogue with David Pohm, Bohm took place in uh, Kalamazoo, it just kind of fell in our hands that both David Bohm himself and myself co-facilitated the dialogue. So it was with that experience that I was asked to run the uh, Albuquerque Dialogues, and consequently, I've been running them ever since. In Bohmian Dialogues, what they talk about and the approach and the, if I can call it, preparation for the participants is really to, as he puts it, and I use his terminology, to a, for a person to rid themselves of tacit infrastructures. There's a whole bunch of trivia that a person carries with them on a daily basis that it, it's basically just trivia, but it occupies the, the memory. It occupies the hard drive, if you can use that metaphor. The whole notion about tacit infrastructures is to try and clear the table. As the Zen philosophers say, hey, you're not going to learn anything because your brain is, you know, your teacup is full. And that's what David Bohm speaks to is, how about if we lay those things aside, at least for the time being, okay, so that we can have something new come into our lives. In native ways, a large number of our ceremonies is about, is about purification. Purification is, when we're talking purification, we're really talking about unloading. The Bohmian notion of tacit infrastructures and purification ceremonies in our culture are kind of speaking to the same thing.